Hello, my name is Meg Sutton and I work with the National Health Career Association in new product development. Today I'm going to be speaking with you about how simulation is changing the game of healthcare training. The objectives for this session are define the three leading types of simulation, discuss considerations for simulation, recognize the design principles used in virtual human simulation, and detect how learning principles are applied in virtual human simulation. The term simulation means different things to different people. We are going to discuss three types of simulation used in healthcare, but know that there are many types and many variations. First, let's look at standardized patient simulation. This type of simulation uses individuals trained to portray the roles of patients, families, members, and others to allow students to practice physical exam skills, history taking skills, communication skills, and other exercises. Although patient complaints and assigned conditions are standardized, the skill set of the actor will vary and consistency between evaluators may be challenging. Another type of simulation that is used in healthcare is computerized full body mannequin simulation. This type of simulation is great to test clinical knowledge and provides learners with feedback to mimic heart rhythms, pulse, breath sounds, and other biological processes. The downside is that these types of mannequins are quite expensive and there are limitations in the regards to number of mannequins available to learners. Then there's virtual human simulation. This type of simulation integrates research in neuroscience and adult learning with the power of gaming technology to create this impactful and engaging experience for the learner. These evidence-based virtual human simulations harness the power of conversation with these virtual humans to improve communication skills and drive sustained behavior change. So what is the common goal amongst all types of simulation? To increase knowledge and understanding and improve training and evaluation. All simulation methods do this to some degree, so do you know which type of simulation is going to be best for your needs? There are four considerations before investing in simulation. One, is the simulation the right tool for the skills that you are trying to improve? Two, is the simulation tool valid? Is it sound? Is it logical? Is it defensively supportable? Three, is it useful? Is it practical in your learning space? And then finally, does the simulation tool fit your budget? Can your institution afford this method? While the majority of simulation products have their place in healthcare training, our focus today will be on virtual human simulation and its effectiveness in improving communication. Daily, we are engaged in multiple conversations. As we engage in these conversations, we are selecting and then filtering thoughts. We're deciding which information should move beyond that gate. To the individual we're communicating with, they're experiencing this as well. We're sorting out all the relevant details from the not so relevant details. Much of the way that we respond to the information coming at us is a direct result of acknowledgement of our memories, our desires, and our goals. For example, if you're nearing the end of a busy work day, when a commitment from your boss diminishes what is left on your dwindling patience, you get upset, you get frustrated, and then it is at that moment that you stop and you reflect and you choose not to just to voice that displeasure, you, you see you recalled a memory of another instance or another employee that lost their cool with that supervisor and the consequences that followed. 
In this case, your emotional system unlocked the door to a cognitive response by remembering what it felt like when your colleague had that interaction. Through the power of simulation, we are able to build these types of models that, that are, that these, we call them mental models, that we use every day. Cognitively, simulation is able to provide learners with important knowledge and techniques to obtain the best outcomes through that didactic content. Emotionally, the simulation is able to illustrate the benefits and consequences of choosing different paths that are ideal and those that are less ideal through branching logic. This creates memories or recall that can be used in future encounters. Live action role play is powerful, but it can create fear, anxiety, and stress for those engaged in role play. Unfortunately, participants are often paired with partners who aren't particularly good at role play or who aren't taking it very seriously. The, one of the wonderful things uh, that is about virtual humans is that they play their parts perfectly every single time. You see, a lot of science goes into where these virtual humans are useful in training and education space. The virtual humans will need to be standardized so that they respond to each person in the exact same way. So when considering characters for healthcare training and education, we definitely need some characters that have specific disease or conditions. These characters should have unique personalities, and sometimes they even have a little, a little attitude. You can also program them to speak any language that, that fits your audience. Next, let's talk a little bit more about the design principles. These virtual humans are what make the experience seem more lifelike. While the design principles pull in the science of learning and the art of conversation and the power of gaming technology. First, situated learning. In situated learning, you are carving out time dedicated to learning and engaging with the experience. In role playing, learners are often in front of others and and feeling more overwhelmed. In situated learning, you are engaged in a scenario that feels very realistic. Um, oftentimes in role play, you can't mimic that realistic environment. In situated learning, you are able to experiment and see how mistakes are made and play through multiple times. This is something that oftentimes we're unable to do in something like role play. Next up, narrative design. The dialogue that is included is written with the intention of being able to bridge the gap of emotional and cognitive states. This allows learning to be seen from a, the perspective of a story. And oftentimes the person that they are playing um, and taking on what they are feeling. An example of this would is to think about how you would apply different communication techniques to someone struggling with a chronic health condition. Maybe the learner hasn't experienced that, but, but in this scenario, they are able to look at it through the eyes of that person with that chronic health condition. Next, segmenting. Segmenting is when you do not give the learner all the information at once. Instead, you're intentionally building along the way. This is also where we take chunks of content and provide, we take the content and chunk it out so that we are allowing the learner to really control the pace of that learning. Next, dual coding. We all know that different people learn in different, in different ways. Um, some learn best through auditory, others experiential, and the list goes on and on. When it comes to simulation design, it is important to take into consideration the incorporation of all sorts of techniques to make sure we're hitting on all learners' best style. 
For example, on-screen gra graphics can give experiential elements, while sound elements can assist those that learn best through auditory. This allows the learner to focus in a way that they process information best. Next, cueing. Cueing is the use of graphics to highlight and transition critical elements within the simulation. This would include thought bubbles, co coaching that comes on screen, and other methods. And then finally, scaffolding. Scaffolding is the building along the way of difficulty. So designers look at how they can create the experience that continues to get more and more challenging that builds the learner's understanding along the way. And we know that these design principles yield better outcomes. So for example, cognitive load. The cognitive load is optimized through segmenting or that's that chunking out of content. The learners are more engaged when they get into the experience as quickly as possible. The smaller segments allow this quick entry into the application of learning. Next, it's safe, safe to disclose an experiment. Ex experimenting allows the learner to make mistakes and to learn from them. This builds confidence without pressure. In our simulations that we build at NHA, we have also built in undo buttons that really prompt the user to play with the simulation as much as possible and so that they see it from all different angles. Maximizing the transfer of learning to long-term memory. Because most of the experiences in a realistic scenario and learners are building, they're building that mental model. This means that when they are live with a patient, they recall the experience and how they should respond. We also see a decrease in tr the transference reactions. Um, this means that there, that this is decreasing the amount of copying somebody else's response that we see. So they are allowed to go through the simulation and not be biased by anyone within their class, somebody that they're doing a role play with, um, or even their instructor. Simulations also allow learners to experience new geographical areas. So if I am in a rural area, my simulation can show me scenarios that are in um, more of an urban setting. I can also um, flip that around so that no matter where I end up in the workforce, I've had an experience and I've started to, to create that memory um, for recall. And also simulations can be offered in multiple languages. So we can engage learners within their native language if that is beneficial to the scenario as well. So let's talk about the research that backs up these learning outcomes. We have a sister company named Cognito that conducted a research project. They create the simulations. Some of these that screenshots that you've been seeing, our sister company Cognito creates these. So they recently conducted a research product project with um, one of their simulations that was an at-risk primary care simulation. Um, this is a course where the learner would go through um, how to conduct a brief intervention, make a referral to treatment, um, all within that primary care setting. So the learners play the role of a healthcare worker who has screening results for two different patients, one that, has, that is at risk for substance abuse and one that's at risk for suicide. Uh, and so learners are able to perform a brief intervention, they make that referral, and they have also have a dynamic conversation with each patient. So this is one of those really good examples of where a learner may not see this all the time within the practice, or even in an education setting, never experience something like this. So the simulation allows them to step into that environment, into that conversation, and really um, learn about what it should, should be like. 
So the study was done in order to assess the impact of the simulation in relation to the knowledge and skills and behaviors that they were looking for. So these results um, are st statistically significant and underscore that engaging in these intentionally designed courses have a demonstrable impact. Not only does this study underscore that learners experienced an increase in knowledge and skills around this SBIRT and the interaction with patients, but it also had clearly had an impact on the success of the program and its metrics for screening, brief interventions, and referrals to treatments. So this is one example of the research that Cognito has done into simulations. I know that some of you would like to get in and, and dig in even more. So if you go to cognito.com, they have um, lots more information studies that you, can, that you can pull up and go through. So now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my personal experience in building products with with simulations and kind of our approach and, and what, how we have structured products with these. So in March, NHA launched a new product called Personability. This is an online training product that helps educators and employers effectively build essential soft skills and drive behavior change in their students and staff members through a unique learning process that uses learning and assessment through this virtual human simulation. So um, we are both doing all of our testing, um, but also all of that teaching within simulation. So learners examine the importance of each essential soft skill, such as emotional intelligence, communication, teamwork, and then they have the opportunity to practice these skills throughout the training. So let's look a little bit at how the design principles of simulation have been applied in this, in this course. So in this image, um, this is coming from personability. This is a good example of situated learning. So the atmosphere here is a doctor's office. We see the interaction between a medical assistant and a patient. And much care and attention has been paid to the atmosphere to make it as realistic as possible so that the learner is engaged. And again, creating that recall. So you'll see posters on the wall, the, the chair, the uniform, the name tag, all of it is to really allow somebody who is in either an education setting or an employer setting to be able to experience and apply skills within a realistic um, uh, environment. All right, next, queuing. So here we have queuing being applied through the use of a virtual coach. So this is here down at the bottom where we have, um, we have our coach coming up, giving us a little bit of guidance about how the conversation should go. And this is highlighting a critical skill. So we use the virtual coach throughout the simulation to really bring up these critical critical components. Other ways that queuing is used in personability that we used it was through, um, through thought bubbles to show what characters are thinking. So that, that good environment there as well. Segmenting. We also see here segmenting being used. An example of this is in the didactic conversation where we're given a little bit of information and then more is uncovered as you go. Um, also here we, we have segmented it out into these conversations. So this support up here um, to, to break it up and then to do a little bit of training on it and then move forward so that the learner is engaged. Dual coding. So dual coding is used through on-screen interactions, closed captioning, audio track, and more. This engages different types of learner in the learning style that they prefer. Another example of a product that we have used virtual human simulation in is this principles of health coaching. So in principles of health coaching, um, we have 
you know, this uses simulation to teach learners how to incorporate motivational interviewing into health coaching sessions that they may have with patients. The simulation portion of the product uses a variety of virtual characters with different personalities to play the part of healthcare professionals, patients, and family members. So here in this scenario, you see um, you know, your medical assistant, your healthcare worker speaking with a mom and a child. This may not be a situation that, that a student has experienced yet um, and someone within a healthcare setting they may not have had this type of conversation. So it's really good to be able to get a learner into that, that learning very quickly. So thank you so much for your time today. In summary, I wanna leave you with three points. One, there are many different definitions of simulation and learning today. Before selecting the simulation method that you will implement in your program, make sure to do your research. And then finally, virtual human simulations can increase the receptivity to education and really thus providing your, your better learning outcomes.